Elegant Sea Urchin is a serial oral fiction written, presented, and produced by Swoon as part of the Greater Swoon Craft Creative. You can support this and all things Swoon by subbing, sharing, becoming a patron, or making a one-time donation. And before the program starts, here is a fact. Ultraviolet is not the end of the visible spectrum. It's just impossible to match your favorite sweater with x-ray. You listening, thanks. And enjoy. When you seek something different than the rest of the world, I think that makes you visionary. There's been a lot of listeners, so let's be visionary. I've felt like a stranger since the blinding ecstasy from the shore. What's in my mind is new, like the blinding ecstasy from the shore is... Let me glimpse something intangible. Something I can't name. School started up again. The faculty looked better. One head specifically seemed giddy to have been back. Uncle Kay told me in confidence that one of the faculty that works at my school spent two days in the desensitization chamber. That might have been the deal with that. Uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm not rippling around the subject. Just, just hear out the whole trickle. Uh, Uncle K, Uncle, uh, Uncle, Uncle K has been weird since my day at the shore. Well, I, I've been weird. It, it could be that he's been weird since the faculty situation. I, I guess there's a lot of things that could be making this happen, um, beyond my own inner revision when I when I really think about it. I asked Grandma about it, and she just said the old adage, who needs a date when you've got cashews? You know, since cashews exist out of time, and it's like saying that if something happened, that doesn't make the sum of all things that happened stranger than usual. I trust Grandma. Um, more than I trust Uncle K, but in the couple years he's been here, I, I just can't agree that this is a singular passing thing. Sorry, sorry, I am drifting. Maybe I should explain what he did. The, the first thing I remember from the peach and pastel yellow ecstasy of the shore was waking up beneath the hand-carved coral bar at home. Enzo and all of his shaggy bone protrusions curled around me. His snout wriggled in excitement when I woke up leaving a warm, sticky heart shape on my neck. I asked him how I got home, but he is never one for talking. When I got my bearings, I realized Uncle K was sitting on the other wall, watching me and Enzo. He didn't say anything to my question either. There was a thunk clatter as I sat up further. The railroad spike. I stared at it. What's the matter with your neck? I was startled by Uncle K's words. While I thought he meant the snot kiss left by Enzo, I felt something else. A dimple or, or indent going all the way around my neck. I was breathing. I felt normal in spite of the trip the spores sent me on, but I didn't know. I, I grabbed the spike and went to our looking glass in the lavatory. What I felt with my fingers was confirmed in my reflection. It looked like I was hung, or someone was trying to crudely cut gills into my neck with rope. I looked down to the spike in my hand, searching my memory for anything. Maybe I remember giggling? I think... Uh, I could barely remember that Henry Bonilla was with me. But that was a start. I could ask the pervert what happened. Looking back up, I got a shock seeing Uncle K behind me in the looking glass. His curly hair and gaunt features were writhing, like something within his shell was thoroughly distraught. Or, or delighted. And he said, Something has changed. Upon turning around, Uncle K appeared normal, his dark eyes transfixed. It reminded me of the first few moons he had arrived. He told me, Go help your great mother with this afternoon's meal. 
and he left. He's been gone for the past week since that day. But I had something more important to get to. Grandma arrived home soon after with a beautiful rainbow tarp. I had the greens and the stock ready, and after a flash roast, we were eating. Grandma always brings in the best catch. The mahogany grain of the fish's cooked flesh was plump and juicy. The bones were a perfect complimentary crunch. I don't know how she does it, but Grimham's fish bones are always perfectly brittle, cooked right to the point when they turn to chewy blubber. My greens were improving. Not the greatest compliment to Grimham's flash roast, but getting better. And the stock I made, well, if you follow directions, it's hard to mess up a flavor. We were both waiting patiently, the quarter hour grace that all families offer their uncles when they're away from a meal, when I asked Grandma, have you ever been submerged in the great moony moss? Her glare at the empty spot at our dining slab turned to a smile once she was fixed on me. Her petite stature and pixie features always charmed me. I don't know if a lot of other family elders are as enchanting as Grandma, but I always feel like I'm seeing her for the first time when she addresses me. And she told me, as a young lady, it was common for us to engorge ourselves in the moony moss. I nodded and looked down at my barely eaten cut of tarp. Is, is it dangerous? Grandma chuckled, saying, danger is an effect of what is done after the ecstasy sets in. There's little that endangers our livelihood. After all, you had a friend with you. I shook my head. Vanilla is far from being anybody's friend. Glancing to the ticker on the wall, Grandma shoved herself up to begin clearing the setting, saying, I know your mind is like the tide on the young Vanilla, but you should know, I think it's a fine thing. I sighed, rolled my eyes, but before I could curse the smogs above, Grandma added, but that child is not the one who I'm talking about. I watched her hand as she removed my plate. I turned my eyes to Enzo, who was lightly snoring, napping before his turn to eat. After Enzo vanished the remains of the flash roast, I left with him and his shining eyes to meet with Bonilla. I didn't know where he would be, but I knew where his family chambers were. I live near the top of the ridges of the cove thanks to a legacy of my ancestors and their contribution to the coast. The Bonillas live near the caves in the deep valley, you know, the ones where you find silt suckers scraping for one last high before being released by death and where we find the bones of relatives and loved ones who were taken by the Pavels. Amazing and terrifying creatures, the Pavels. Did you know female Pavels ovulate on command? So they can literally choose which male they want to bear their amazing and terrifying nits. Color me envious, I'm not looking forward to my three chances to bear an offspring. I've been to a couple of Grandma's friends' seating parties, and I do not like the spectacle of being on display for something that we had biologically changed an epoch ago to control the population. That's how society works, though. One side of two gives something for the better of all. Uh, as I'm casting these waves, there's a wonderful tangerine sky that's giving me those fading inklings of death. What was I talking about? Bonilla, yes. Um, well, I went down to the drugs and found Bonilla's family chambers. It was pretty nice considering the lack of purple shine that penetrates through to the depths. I would argue that it felt like I was breathing sludge instead of the mere miasma I'm accustomed to in the high ridge. So I wonder anyone down here has an appetite at all. For being lined with chambers, Everything was fairly nice, except for the bones left over from predators and an eight-legged cat I saw digging through a rubbish bin, but it didn't notice me, and Enzo paid it no mind. And now, I wonder if he's dealt with eight-legged cats before. The Bonilla Hollow was oddly bright. I think there's something wrong. I said that before. In the moment, I felt the full weight of whatever the gnawing wrongness was. I fingered the iron spike that I had fastened to the vest of my dress, looking at the Bonilla Hollow and how it didn't embody the dregs I thought the caves were. 
I looked down at Enzo, thinking on these past weeks. So much was happening. Maybe things are always changing. But I had something to get to. A first taste of answers. So I knelt down to Enzo, telling him that since he had a big meal, to be mindful and not vanish any of the Bunilis family's belongings. His shining eyes twinkled and his pig snout wriggled. I took this for... Let's get this over with since I can't and probably wouldn't if I could tell you what happened, Faye. Entering the chamber, I was met in the Bonilla parlor by the resident uncle. He greeted me curtly and began wringing his hands once he got a good look at Enzo. Uncle Three, he introduced himself as. I had only heard through the waves about numbered uncles. He interrupted my musing, asking, You must be here for the young Bonilla. Yeah, I, um, need to find something out. And so he said, I think Miss Fay, yeah, he knew my name. You'll find out more than you anticipate. And I anxiously shuffled my feet, telling him that I didn't doubt it, and then asked where Bonilla's alcove was. The channels through the Bonilla Hollow made me nervous. The tunnels were too long, or too narrow, but the residents didn't seem bigger than mine. Enzo resonated my thoughts, his bristled fur shoved against my thigh as we glided down the green glinting and faded blue hall. It was a frankly horrible sensation, like the glittering channels were writhing and twisting, making our expedition seem impossibly long, for one being a trek to an alcove in a hollow, and in the back of my mind, saw his twisted features yes. from the looking yes. glass. I heard yeah. Uncle K say again, yes. something, something has changed. changed. Something has changed. Kicking an eight-legged cat would be better than this horrible swell within me when I turned to face the entrance of Bonilla's alcove. Eyes like full moons watched me as I opened the door. The swell inside me burst into a dizzying vortex. The figure facing me was curvy, unfamiliar in a very uncomfortable way. My knees felt like splintering stilts, and the figure moved towards me. Her face not too plump, but shaped in a way that reminded me her eyes squinting the same way Bonilla squints. Her. She was taller than me, and while I was nervous before that Bonilla was larger than me, my dollars of the fractured magenta dimension, she stunk of, of sweets and powder. I demanded to know, who in great relech are you? My cheeks were red hot, and I swear my vision was wrapped in magenta cellophane. Faye, it's me, Heather Bonilla. A cheerful smile, full of anticipation, dropped to a sour, downcast gaze. Here, you're low tide. Having trouble meeting my prying eyes, she gestured. Sit, ice your mind. <laughs>